and welcome to a new episode of Her Voice, the show that's created for mod modern women in society. Fashion has become a large part of identity making in the post-human world in which people play dress up with their clothing. Fashionable clothes reinvent people as desirable and enigmatic. We care about what we wear a great deal because our culture emphasizes an outward appearance. You may not be chasing fashion, but you can't be indifferent because fashion is inherent in our culture and people are always impressed by those who know the taste of trendiest trends. Our appearance depends on what we are wrapped in. Fashion is about our social status, success, individualism and good taste. In today's show, we will be looking at how fashion has evolved over the years in the Middle East with the introduction of Euro-American trends and fashion designs that's invaded the wardrobes of women across the region. We will be talking to young female designers that have managed to combine the fusion of the Middle East with the modern Western themes to produce successful labels in fashion, perfumery and jewellery. But before I introduce my guests, let's watch this video. Over the last decade, a new generation of designers has emerged to reshape the Middle East fashion scene. The fashion and clothing of women in the Middle East represents an evolution of historical and political change and a mixture of influences that has enriched and modernized its diverse cultures and produced a custom of dress, both progressive and yet true to its traditional design identities. Although distinct fashions can be traced back to particular regions, the overall effect is a vast collection of clothing traditions adapted and adjusted to new social orders, local climates and activities. Women from the Middle East have become the world's biggest buyers of hot couture fashion. Their social calendars create a much bigger demand for couture than the occasional charity ball and high society party in Europe and in North America and wearing the same dress twice is not an option. Fashion executives say the Middle East is likely to remain the top couture client for the foreseeable future if the economic environment deteriorates in Europe and North America. According to consultancy firm Bain & Company, the luxury fashion and design sectors in 2014 were worth more than 14.7 billion US dollars across the Gulf alone, with a UAE accounting for 6.26 billion US dollars of that total. But this trend is changing with the rise of new Middle Eastern, African and Asian designers that recognize the economic advantage that could be derived from serving not only the rich but of middle class ones as well. A new generation of women designers have emerged who proclaim themselves more able than their male counterparts in coming up with new designs that are in tune with the latest fashion. Middle Eastern fashion designers have become regular attendees of international fashion shows and fairs where they get the latest information on styles, fabrics and colors and gain inspiration for their own garments. They then adapt Euro-American trends to the tastes of their clientele where most of the new styles they develop are characterized by cross-cultural fusion of Middle Eastern and Euro-American trends. Talented fashion designers like El Saab and Zuhair Murad are proving there is creativity beyond the fashion capitals of the world that stems from the Middle East. It is obvious that the fashion scene has actually quite changed over the Middle East and therefore we would actually like to sort of take this opportunity today in talking about the fashion um, sort of trend in the Middle East by introducing my guests this, this evening with me. I've got Miss Hannah Amir and Miss Aisha Zia. Um, Hannah is actually a costume and theatrical designer and um, Aisha Zia, she's the CEO and founder of Aisha Zia Perfume. Welcome to the show, girls. Um, it's lovely to see you and joining me here. Um, Hannah, um, what, or how would you describe the actual fashion industry in the Middle East in terms of the costumes and designs? Um, it's definitely booming in terms of uh, both fashion and costume combining. Like uh, They both complement each other, obviously. Um, a lot of uh, fashion designers take their inspiration from costume and obviously costume is a representation of uh, what we wear as people in the street. Um, so they definitely do inform one another and in the Middle East um, 
it's quite an exotic uh, location for um, for the Western world. So people do definitely designers do um, do take into account the idea of exoticism and otherness when looking at uh, inspirations from uh, derived from the Middle East themselves, especially periodic costume period costumes from. Um, like you can look back, there's the harem pants, for example. This was this was a Middle Eastern inspiration for a lot of designers lately. Fantastic. Um, the dramatic change in the fashion culture and the trends in the Middle East. Um, how did it happen? How did it come about? Um, obviously, the political situation and the socio-economic situation recently has. Um, has been fluctuating in the Middle East, and mm. I, um, it's 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 almost certain you can see the the uncertainty and the ter the turmoil that's happening within the Middle East being portrayed in the diversity and the very extreme uh, difference in what people are wearing. You have people who are becoming more conservative, that's right. and at the same time, you have people who are becoming more open and more Western in the way they dress. And the gap is actually getting bigger and bigger, it's which expanding. is which is quite amazing, you know. And um, do you think that has anything to do with the influence from the Euro-American styles that are actually invading now the Middle East, and it's changing the concepts of design and fashion? Definitely, definitely. Um, um, I, I think. Uh, you have to take into account the psychological um, element here when we're looking at people and we're observing their actions and the way they dress and their appearance. Um, a lot of Middle Eastern people take it as a form of escapism. Right. Looking abroad at like, I know, the American dream in the past and now yes. it's still there. Yes, yes. So it is, it, it's a way of um, compensating or, or kind of um, moving on, right. a way of making things seem better and focusing on different aspects of life other than the political situations. Mm. Well, I've got Aisha now. Um, Aisha, I met you at the Capitan Festival yes. um, in Westfield, London. And um, what intrigued me about yourself is the fact that you've actually created your own perfume, which we have right here with <laughs> us, um, and um, which is sort of you know somebody you know at your young, young age, and um, you know you just probably started off. How did you come about in, in designing something like this, and where did this idea come from? To be honest with you, it was something I've wanted to do for a very long time, but it was, it was a dream, and we all have dreams when, right, when, when we're children. <laughs> but I think my biggest inspiration was my mom, and, and I say this and I say it to everyone, and they all just like, really? Oh. But it, she really was, you know, since I've been little, I've always just watched her put perfume on or put all these luxury creams on, yes. and I thought, wow, I wish I had something that she would use, you know, yes. like when I was 10, 11. And, then I started studying, I did interior design, so I was always quite creative. I liked things, I liked colours, I liked creating different things. And then I was given the opportunity when I went to the Middle East right. and, and I, I met a chemist and, and the story began. And, and my mum was like, and she's, she's supported me, she's always been like, no, go for it. And even when I've sat with her and I've said, oh, there's so many things out there, you know, how am I gonna, how am I gonna cope? There's so much competition. She goes, no, you don't, you don't need to think like that. You just be yourself. And mm. I spent ages like creating the blends and, mm. you know, and I've tried to make them as unique as possible. Yes. yes. And um, yeah, so that's, that's been the journey so far. Did you face any challenges though by, by obviously venturing out in a, in a sort of a something like that? I, I have to say, yes, I did. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't straightforward. It wasn't something that you can just go pick up and make, you know. It's, there's a lot of legality, especially when you're bringing it to the UK. And because Oud is quite a strong oil-based perfume, um, it's not very, it, it's not so easy to sell an Oud perfume here as it would be to sell it in the Middle East. So if I was to sell my product in, in let's just say, Dubai, for example, it would be a lot easier mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, but bringing it here and selling it in stores, there's a lot, you know, they, they have to be a certain amount of percentage. Mm. And, you know, it's a lot of a lot of legal terms, which I would bore you if I sat here and yes, explained yes, to you. Yes, yes, um, yes, but, but I think I'm trying to just, I'm getting over all the difficulties and I'm just getting to enjoy it a little bit That's because I've, I've done all the groundwork and I've, I've based the foundations. I've made the foundations quite strong and I just want to build on it now. Yeah. Well, can you describe to our viewers the perfume? I mean, perfume itself. Uh, oh. We've got obviously... <laughs> 
There's two. Two samples um, here. Um, okay. What kind are they? One, of, the, one of them's called Irem. Um, that's actually my niece. Um, oh, so right. Her name is Irem. <laughs> so I, I wanted to make it quite personal. And she's a complete little sweetheart. So she's like, oh, you know, you're going to make it mine. And now I've got all the other kids. Like, okay, when are you going to make it for us? <laughs> um, and that is just a really sweet, it's got oud in it, um, but it's very... It's very floral and, and people in the UK, so again, I've used oud, which is quite Middle Eastern, but I've still made it quite Western because I want to kind of target it to people that are just ordinary people that will be able to buy it. Yes. Whereas oud, which is just, it's called the oud, um, so it's quite strong. It is very strong, um, yes. But now, I mean, this is the craziest part, is now oud is becoming so popular mm, in, mm. in our market, yes. in, in the UK. Like everyone, everyone knows about it. And for me, I just remember as a child, oud was something you'd see in the Middle East. You wouldn't even know about it that's here. Yes. So that, that's pretty nice. And, and oud, I've gone for more of like a stronger smell. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got dehnal oud in it, so mm -hmm. it's quite strong it stays on your body for absolutely that's ages. true I've noticed when I've used it it was quite strong actually to the extent that yes. even when I was sleeping and then you know, in the evening I'd still smell it you know on my on my hands and no it's a beautiful beautiful fragrance well, but we will be like it. talking more about about your lovely product um, uh, we did actually like I said we did meet you at the Kaftan festival um, and the Kaftan festival did host many female fashion and jewelry designers from the Middle East and um, that Levant TV has managed to catch up with and ask how they started their fashion label and who was their inspiration. So let's see what they had to say. I started my business uh, about 10 years back as a hobby, being a housewife. Um, it was from home and a few exhibitions at home. And uh, uh, three years back, I met a stylist from London Fashion Week who was really impressed with my collection. And that's how I went into uh, London Fashion Week in 2013. And that's when I decided to form a limited company. I got uh, some uh, celebrities as well, um, like my collection, and I was in uh, the magazine, local magazine. And uh, that's it, I'm here promoting my brand in Westfield today. I started my business from very few pieces, and uh, it was basically friends and family who wanted to uh, just order one off, and then they wanted to see more colors and I increased my two, three pieces to 10 pieces to an exhibition once to twice a year. And I don't know how, but then the collection and the idea start developing, the concept started to you know, take forms and it just landed up in a big collection today. If someone wants to set up a business, I don't think it's um, very hard in today's uh, time. Uh, I mean, I, start, I didn't even know today I would be here standing with a limited company. It's just, uh, if you have an interest and if you have a will to do it, I think it, own, it takes its own path and you can achieve whatever you want to. I believe in there's one life and there's only one chance you have to fulfill your dreams and that has to be today and now. Um, and being in Little Tony Bean in six weeks that I've had the business going, I've had the pleasure of being at Top Draw in Olympia and releasing and launching the label there and at Sevira for women of Arabic origin or Muslim women of London and England. That was only last weekend. And now to be here today with uh, the Kaftan Expo at Westfield Shopping Center is fantastic. Anyone who wanted to start up their own business, I'd say if you've got an affinity for it and a feel for it, I used to be in fashion some 25 years ago when I, before I had my daughter. But to go back into it is just wonderful. If you have a feel for it, you have a good joy, go for it, enjoy it. It, it. I'm working from the morning till the evening and absolutely loving it. I'm Anisa from Indonesia and I start my business is, uh, from one, uh, one month ago. I design for my hobby and it is all uh, about the passion. I love it and uh, it is my passion. Like a my hobbies, it's all. I will uh, join my uh, fashion show in another country and I will to, uh, bring uh, all to my design. And my design is uh, it's different. It's uh, like a bling and a glamour and a caption or abaya in another country. It is lovely, actually. There's so much, um, you know, sort of different designs there that are um, quite um, visually beautiful. Um, Aisha, I wanted to ask you this. If everyone had a hobby, 
um, or craft uh, or passion for something, say in art, jewellery, whatever, would, would they become fashion designers? I mean, wouldn't we all become fashion designers? <laughs> I, I, I just believe in one thing. If you, if I said this actually just the other day, if you have a passion or if you have a dream, there is nothing that should stop you. You should just look forward, not look back, because there's competition, there's going to be people that are going to pull you down, and sometimes it's the closest people, your friends, you know? Mm. It's crazy how, how many friends you actually lose whilst you're trying to do this, and when you've made it, they're like, oh my God, it's great, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's good, you just have to look forward, and you have to think you're going to do it, because if, if you think you can, then you most probably, mm. you most mm. probably will. Hannah, what's the criteria to become a leading fashion designer, do you think? Um, obviously, one has to be really, um, really passionate about their art because being a fashion designer, you should never underestimate what it takes to be a fashion designer because you have to have this really strong will and this ability to overcome obstacles, problem solve. Public commitment as well. Yes. A lot Nothing of commitment. Your back, family, <laughs> etc. Exactly. And of course the ability to foresee um, um, what people want and what people are expecting. Um, because you're not only just um, setting a trend out for people, it's like you're setting out history. This is part of history. It's, right. it, it's kept in the archives, what people wear tell us about what they did and, and, and what life was at the time in the past, like if you're looking yeah. at the past. So um, it, it's a great responsibility and a fashion designer should be as innovative as they can be, but at the same time have a lot of, it, almost be like an anthropologist at the oh, same right, time. Yes, and yes. a psychologist. Okay, and a psychologist, that's <laughs> a good one, yes, put it together. Yeah. But um, Aisha, why perfume? Why not bags, clothes? Jewelry. <laughs> no, what's better than smelling good? <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's, it's, it's something that I, I love. I love perfumes. You should see my collection. <laughs> I think um, that means two of us. <laughs> and, and I think it's something I love, you know? Yes, yes. I mean, because I'm just going to sort of just basically have a show just, you can you know, so it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful perfume. So I quite yeah. I quite quite like it. Um, and and like I said, it smells absolutely absolutely gorgeous. Um, what is your brand's philosophy? I mean, we're talking about sort of you know this this perfume. What's what's your brand's philosophy, Aisha Zia? Well, it's my name, yeah. um, and I feel like I when I was doing the whole packaging, and I wanted to keep it quite quite simple. I don't I didn't want to keep it too colourful, so. We've gone for kind of like really basic colours. The tassel, just, yeah. I don't know, it's just a feel. I love tassels, I'm, yes. you know. And even when I was doing it, the, the person that was designing the bottle for me goes, tassel, are you, are you sure? I was like, please, just do it. And he goes, tassel, I was like, don't ask me again. You know, it's, it's what I want. Um, yes. And I'm, I've just given it. It's all me, you know, all of it, every part of it. Um, from the writing to the back, to the, the way the black and the gold is, it's, it's just, I think it just... If you knew me, you'd know that's yes. something I would create. That's you. you know? That's you. Yeah. Um, Hanan, um, why is it that um, the Middle East has got the highest percentage of women um, who purchase sort of, you know, sort of uh, designer goods uh, in comparison to the fe their female counterparts in the West? And that's something that's actually we've we've um, sort of um, put into our VT, you know, our video as well, that we've actually managed to get um, a proper static statistic, you know, about the fact that you know women. In, in the Middle East are by far much more sort of into designer labels than the West. Why is that? Well, of course, even without looking at statistics, you can tell <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that uh, Middle Eastern women are very glamorous and uh, even just walking into even just Oxford Street, I'm not saying bigger, yeah. um, okay. bigger department stores, you would you would see a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, Middle Eastern women. Um, I think it's to do, it's, it's a cultural thing as well as a, um, the fact that women in the Middle East, it's part of the culture not to really be um, working. Yeah. So, so this is, a, this is um, so the woman devotes a lot of her time to, to, to other activities and one of them is, is going shopping and, and, and taking care of oneself, which is quite interesting considering um, a lot of Middle Eastern women are veiled, but they do take care of themselves really well. And this is opposing the Western idea of women being oppressed. In fact, no, if you're a Middle Eastern woman, you would tell the West yes. 
No, we're not being oppressed. On the contrary, yes, that's you see, true. You yes. see a woman wearing a abaya. Like I, I used mm. to live in Saudi Arabia, and uh, I go there a lot, and it's really interesting. I see women wearing abaya, but then buying all these fashionable clothes. And I do hear a lot of comments of, from people from the West asking me here in the UK, um, why are they buying all these colorful, beautiful clothes if they're not going to show them off to the world? And I always tell them it's not fashion, it's not showing yourself off to the world, it's feeling good about yourself as well. It is feeling good about yourself and also, um, obviously through a bit of research as well about this topic, um, quite a lot of them have um, these important parties and functions that they tend to go to, exactly. which um, sort of is a very, very vital part of their lifestyle to show off, you know, what, what exactly. new sort of, you know, designer label they've got on or what fashion designer that they're wearing. And, and that is something that happens to, you know, happens to be the norm over back there. So it's, it's incredible um, how, they, how they lead their lifestyles. But again, you know, if, you talk, if you're talking about fashion, um, what about the actual sort of um, designs themselves? I mean, you're talking about abayas. Abayas are very beautiful, you know, they're very long and flowy and they tend to be worn out outdoors as well and as, in, as indoors. Um, what about the actual designs of the costumes in terms of the films and, and the filmmaking and, and you know, you know theatre and stuff? Because I know that that's different. You know, traditional costumes are completely different from what they tend to be wearing in movies and, and, and theatre. So you know, what's, what's the, how does that compare? I mean, how, what's, what's that like? Um, in the Middle East, um, it's quite different to, to uh, the Western world in terms of costume. Um, um, because I'm a costume designer and I've, I've, I've lived here and I went to university here, um, and going back to um, my country, to Egypt, to work, um, to work as a costume designer there, I, I noticed the difference. In the, it's the difference in aesthetics and the difference in, for example, costume preservation and the way not just the person wears their costume, but the, the way a costume is dealt with in other various aspects. So you have the designer, the, the, the dresser, the seamstress. Every person deals with a costume differently and every every person in Egypt has an input on what the costume will look like in the end. You even have designers, um, um, sorry, um, the people, the, the, the actresses or the yes. dancers wearing the costumes, they usually have an input. I, I spoke to uh, a ballerina who told me she sewed on the beading herself onto her costume 10 minutes before the show, which is incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. So you have, I feel there is a certain degree of um, this elaborate personal element in um, in Middle Eastern costumes that's not available in the Western. Whilst the Western could look more sophisticated on screen, yes. I do feel there is um, a lot of a lot of other like um, uh, other factors involved yes. that are not within. Uh, that we cannot use costume just to blame on, on the, f the fact of sophistication. You have yes. green screen affecting costume, polishing a costume a lot. You have uh, different lighting effects. All that, that does... That does all sort of work together and come together, doesn't it? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly. amazing. That's, um, I mean, you know, your, your, you know the, your side of your business or whatever you're actually doing is, is very sort of intriguing because there's so much involved and um, I'm sure it takes up a lot of your time. Um, <laughs> Aisha, perfume. Does it complement a woman? <laughs> of course, it, it, it makes you feel confident. It kind of, see again, it's, it's what you guys were just talking about. It's what you feel inside, isn't it? It's when you wake up in the morning, whatever you do, and then you put the perfume on, it, it kind of resembles you. Yes. And the, the better the fragrance, the better you're gonna kind of feel, you know? You're That's never right. gonna wake up and put something on that you're not gonna like the smell of, and then no. you're gonna, no. you know, you're gonna feel like that. So it, 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 may, it plays a massive part, you know, That's in, in oh, everyone's life. I'm glad life. to know that, because I personally can't go out without my perfume. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also like to welcome on the show, um, via the phone, I've got Miss Belkis al Khadib. She's a young, successful um, fashion designer for La Viso from Saudi Arabia. Belkis, welcome to the show. Yes, hello. Hello, sorry to have kept you. <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Um, Belkis, you're an inspiration to so many young female women in the Middle East and uh, globally because you managed to design your own fashion brand from scratch and go global with it. Could you tell us more about it, please? Uh, yes, actually, uh, the beast is the line for ready to wear evening gown, and it was uh, actually the outcome of my love of art since in the early age. And, and then it evolved, uh, eventually evolved into designing. 
uh, I released my first collection in 2012, and mostly it was in, uh, in exhibitions and social media. Uh, people actually gave me that confidence to go forward with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my line, I like uh, usually to use the shop cut style that gives out uh, that edgy look for a woman, and at the same time that does not lose the elegance and sophistication, which is what a confident woman is looking for. Fantastic. How much time and effort does this business take from you, Balkis? Because I'm sure um, you know you're probably fully committed to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, beginning any business from scratch is just, uh, I mean, it's quite challenging. But as long as you have that will and, and facing any obstacles is, is fulfilling, despite the outcome that you'll get of it. Mm. Uh, actually, I try to dedicate as much as time as I have into it, and uh, usually it shows with the designs, the details, choosing the colors and fabrics to give each design its own character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you actually describe the woman that wears your clothes? What kind of woman is she? Uh, I will say it's kind of the, uh, an, an, an uh, elegant woman who likes to be uh, a bit edgy. Right. So yes. it's usually like, you know, that bold and edginess and, and, and every woman will come out with my designs. I see. Um, Hannah, um, who's my studio guest, in, in what way has the actual theatrical film and cinema um, sort of um, managed to portray these elegant sort of edgy designs into the sort of, you know, the costume business? within the actual film and industry because you can see the, the actual designs, they're so beautiful, they're so flowy. So how, how has that come about? Um, it definitely does show, especially with the colours and the fine embroidery, it's taken up a notch in, 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 in the film industry. You always have to exaggerate and emphasise things and, and like you see those beautiful yes, embroidered so beautiful. designs yes. and the flowy fabrics are, given, yes. are giving this extra um, uh, oomph to them in the That's film right. industry yeah. and you'll see a lot of the time especially in dance scenes in the film yes we see the the, the slow motion and the fabric moving which moving is what softly. we've just seen with the with the design on the exactly. catwalk there it's so beautiful yes. isn't it um Belkis, who's your fashion icon that sh um you get all your ideas from um i would say i'm actually fascinated with uh, with a lot with the work of a lot of international designers such as the uh, Murad, alexander mcqueen and Marquesa, they have this weirdness in their designs that is like a, it gives the design a different look. That's true. Uh, yes. I can say that what inspires me is, is not limited. Uh, I also like uh, the ornaments of the Victorian and Baroque area. Uh, that this decorative art is the, is usually a, is the key to my uh, to my uh, what I use in my design. I see. And what um, should we be expecting from you in your new collection, Belkis? Um, uh, well, actually, I'm looking forward for the collection of uh, the summer, uh, SF 2015, uh, which will be released in about uh, a few months from now. Fantastic, fantastic. And also, I hear the good news as well today. It's a big day for you, so um, I do wish things go well for you today. Yes, yes. <laughs> they are going until now. <laughs> well done, days, well everything. done. Well, congratulations, congratulations. It's so lovely so um, for you giving us your time and uh, you know speaking with us today. Thank you so much. Thank it's lovely you for, talking to you. for introducing me today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um, Aisha, like you said, your perfume has actually got quite a strong scent of um, oud and wood. How did you actually start exper experimenting and putting these things together? Because I can imagine you with a lab coat sitting <laughs> in the lab, you know, putting bits and pieces together and then trying to think, okay, does that smell right or not? <laughs> no, it, 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 it is actually really complicated. I had to um, meet a chemist um, because I'm not trained to work in a lab by myself because I don't have that, yeah. that kind of qualification. So um, you have to be supervised and they, they sign like a disclosure form that they're not allowed to, right. you know, completely <laughs> see what the ingredients are. But, they, but see, I was quite lucky because he was one of my dad's very good friends. Um, so when, when we were there, it was, I was mixing everything wrong. I was like, I want rose with, with amber. And he goes, no. Um, and he helped me. I, I, I have to give him credit for that. But I had a specific smell that I wanted. You know, I didn't want something too sweet and I didn't want something too strong. So finding that balance, it, it was hard. It, and it took, it took time. You yes, know, my imagine. first fragrance <laughs> took ages. Um, like Irem, I, I spent a lot of time on that. Where Oud just kind of just came because of the first one. Yes. So. Um, Hannah, how, how do you think that, do you think that there's a surplus of fashion designers um, 
in the Middle East, um, or is it just uh, the beginning of a trend? I think there's just the right amount right now, um, and it, the more we have, the more they add to the table of designs and inspiration, because the Middle East in itself is a world on its own. Yeah. Um, so if you if you um, see the, the, the ratio of Middle Eastern designers to Westerns. Definitely there is a boom now. We're coming closer to the number of Westerns, but we're, st we're still not quite there yet. Mm. Which, which is, I think it's, 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 um, it's a positive sign. It shows how in the East, in the Middle East, we are um, exposing ourselves to art and we're allowing art and culture to penetrate our, um, the, the thought that only um, only um, subjects like um, more, more serious scientific subjects are are what is valid in society. So we're giving importance, we're giving credibility to art because fashion is a form of art. Yes. So we're giving this, the, we're giving fashion designers this opportunity to express themselves to their, through fabric, through colors, textiles, designs. Um, Aisha, how would you actually describe your personal aesthetic, uh, and where do you see yourself in the future? That's a good question. Um, I, I would like to say that I want to be um, in all the high street brands. Um, it's it's going to take time, but we've had good conversations um, and it is looking promising. So, I mean, I've done like a six month plan. I, I don't want to say I had my PR person and she's like, let's do a 12 month. And I was like, no, let's just look six months and then we'll plan the other six months. Yes. And we, I want to increase the, you know, the product line as well because I get so many people that are like, oh my God, when's the third one coming out? <laughs> so, so inshallah, I mean, I think probably right now, just focus on letting people enjoy these two and then possibly in the next six months, take another two out and then by the end of the year, be stocked in one of excellent. the big high street brands. That's, yes, that's, we've that's all got the it set out. <laughs> yes. Which is excellent. And what about you, Hannah? Have you got any plans for the future? Yes, um, I was just telling Aisha I would like to, um, I'm in the process of uh, um, opening up my own haute couture brand which is midway between fashion industry and costume. So, and I wanted to cater for the Middle East and for a certain conservative um, um, society that, that requires like, f like party dresses that are very elegant but at the same time conservative and um, and, and elaborate. Fantastic. I do wish you best of luck. I do have a, um, a, a VT which I would like to sort of um, show and it basically sort of sums up what we've actually been talking about in terms of the fashion designers. So um, we will follow through this, with this VT um, that sums up what we've just been talking about today in today's show. Uh, my background is fine art. Um, art and design is something I've always been passionate about. I used to design jewelry as a kid, just for fun and hobby. Uh, I think I was 26 when I decided to um, study jewelry at Central St. Martin uh, College of Art and Design in London. So the whole thing started professionally from there. Both culture have a huge influence and impact in my work um, and it's a great advantage because I use it to benefit my work um, and I think I have better understanding of both culture when it comes to designing jewelry.
And on the phone today, um, we have Farida al -Bennai. Um She's the fashion designer for Two Sisters, who's actually joining us now from United Arab Emirates. Welcome to the show, Farida, and thanks for joining us. Welcome, and thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Um, Farida, can you tell us more about Two Sisters, and how did it start? I started it as a, a hobby, mm -hmm. uh, designing my own clothes and the buyers. Very nice. And then, yeah, uh -huh. and my daughter also. Excellent, excellent. So yeah. it, it came about as a hobby then, and then it started building up from there. Yeah, everybody asked me about my designs, where I did it, yeah. and uh, I started my business. That's excellent. And um, who is your target market? I mean, what kind of women are you targeting with your designs for Two Sisters? Are you looking for the independent businesswoman, or is it more of the fashionable one, or is it more of the glamorous one? No, I have uh, designs for everyone, the prices also. I see. I don't market for uh, specific people. I see. Okay. And um, how do, how is actually your designs? What can you describe us? Describe more about your actual designs. You know your your clothesline. Um, I have many designs like Victoria Victoria designs and Abaya. Yes. and modern. I make them. And um, do, um, do your actual designs themselves, I mean, do you have jewelry included with it or is it just purely sort of the actual sort of design in the material? What? Yeah. So do you add jewelry to it? Because this is something I picked up about your designs, your dresses. They're beautiful with the jewelry that's been embellished on it. Yeah, I have jewelry and everything with the, I, I design accessories with them. Excellent. For Excellent. weddings and parties. Fantastic. And um, how do you see your um, fashion um, line? I mean, do you see it sort of um, uh, doing well in the, in the Gulf region and then spreading globally? Or how do, how do you see your fashion um, sort of design doing? Or will it do? Yes, I'm seeing that uh, I'm doing well because I traveled to Qatar and uh, London. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Frida, for joining us today. I'm, sure, I'm sorry it was um, last minute, but um, maybe we will talk to you again um, next time. But thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of our show. I would like to thank costume designer for film and performance, Hannah Amer, for joining us today and, joining us in, in, and giving us an insight into the world of um, costumes and designs in the MENA region. I would also like to thank Aisha Zia, CEO and founder of Aisha Zia Fragrances, for coming all the way from Leicester to be with us in today's show. Finally, many thanks goes to Balkis al Khadib, fashion designer for Labiso, who joined us also um, by phone from um, Saudi Arabia. We are seeing a new generation of highly talented designers, such as our guests in today's show, who continue to impress the international fashion world with their fusion of modern and Muslim-inspired elements into their ensembles. Each of the new creative works is reflective of the transition from plain and simple Arabic designs to more sophisticated creations that extensively use embroidered elements. But it's not just great designers who are making it to market, it's the actual people and service industry behind this market that is going viral to make fashion designers in the Middle East globally recognized in a leading Euro-American industry. Thank you for watching and goodbye.